This is the American Law Journal. The NFL concussion settlement, a good deal for the players, or is the field tilted in favor of the owners and the lawyers? Good evening, I'm Christopher Naughton. Welcome to ALJ. A Philadelphia judge and a group of attorneys have structured a $675 million settlement offer to ex-NFL players who were injured in the league. To settle or not to settle? That is the question. Gina Passarella with the Legal Intelligencer reports. After years of controversy, the NFL concussion settlement is nearly a done deal. <laughs> nearly. You know, Patrick, it seems to me that uh, I don't know what number would satisfy the Sean Morey group that's going to be going up against uh, this NFL mm -hmm. settlement and the fairness hearing uh, this, this upcoming week. A billion dollars, two billion dollars. But I've got to think that it's as much about the secrecy as it is about the dollars. No, I think you're absolutely right. Let me go ahead and just roll right to Chad Levitt here, because here's what he did. Even though he doesn't agree with this NFL settlement, here's what he chose to do. So personally, I filed an objection. I attached, basically attached my name to the formal objection, objection prepared by Sean Morey. Um, Sean, I believe, has since opted out. I did not opt out, and the reason for that is this is just too much time and energy and effort for me to take on the NFL m myself. Yeah, and Steve, well, even though you don't really agree with this settlement, you call it a joke, you represent NFL players. Some of those players, if they come to you and they say, do I take the settlement? In some cases, you say yes. You, you, you have to, Christopher. The NFL has this sword of Damocles. Over, or the perceived sort of Damocles, this arbitration clause, that the NFL, if they wanted to pull the plug tomorrow and say, okay, we're done, we're taking this to arbitration, they could do that, could they not? Well, that's up to the judge. This has got to really be the low point for the Pennsylvania judiciary, what it's gone through in these last six to 12 months. I heard somebody call it a laughing stock of the entire country, and that's not really a, a list you want to be on the bottom of. People just don't expect to hear their justices talking about porn or calling each other sociopaths and, and all of the infighting and the personal animus. It's just, I think, taken a lot of people back, even people who've watched the court for 20 years and seen previous scandals. At just about every term, and you know, this is the first Monday in October as we uh, go live here tonight, and that means it's the first day of the Supreme Court term. And, uh, you know, you can bet your bottom dollar that every term the Supreme Court is going to take a look at a Fourth Amendment case. That's how important it is you know, to our democracy. And a case is now before this Supreme Court that they're going to hear this year dealing with a broken taillight. We hear that, we hear about that all the time. And this is actually about a brake light that was out in North Carolina. This is from South Carolina recently. A stop for not wearing a seatbelt. Man goes to get his license. Shot once, twice. Shot at three and four times. Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Despite having no weapon. Okay. I know that we don't uh, have the entirety of the videos that we can show to you tonight, but as I look at that, it, is it that much of a leap to say that sometimes, sometimes, we're shooting first and asking questions later? I think that's that's absolutely right, and uh, it just shows you the value of videotapes. This whole big boom in the diagnosis of bipolar disorder which happened over the past 10 years is just extraordinary. Then why was your profession at the forefront of getting these drugs to these kids? Well, because I think that uh, there was... Was there a pecuniary interest? I mean, what well, is Peter, it? Were they the, not informed? The guy at Harvard, you know, we all uh, think that Harvard is the holy grail. And, Doc, let's finish with you tonight. We've seen that there are big changes with ProPublica and uh, watchdog groups taking a look at how many dollars and publishing the amounts that those doctors receive from pharmaceutical companies. I think between that and lawyers, generic drugs, and maybe the lack of financial incentive may finally be changing things in your profession. I don't what do think, you think? I think that you're totally overstating the role of uh, litigation in prescribing practices. You don't think that they've been frightened? You don't think these big drug companies have been frightened at all by 1.6, 2.2, 2.3 billion? I mean, is it really that much of a drop in well, the Well, you're making an association that I'm not willing to make. You're making these, yes, I think it has totally changed the practice of uh, pharmaceutical companies. It has changed the relationship between pharmaceutical companies and physicians. That's all I was I, asking, really. 
but we really do have to send a personal message to the liars, the cheats, the thieves who operationalize these frauds in corporations. You nailed it. These frauds are actually about people, and there's a lot of misery. There's poisoning for profit. There's bankruptcy, um, and it really is about a human uh, tragedy. Joe Troutwine, again, no one seems to go to jail. And not only that, but in some of these cases where U.S. prosecutors get over a billion dollars, we find that the corporations plead to a criminal charge, but it's always a misdemeanor. People's lives have been changed, thousands of lives may be ruined, and all they plead to is a misdemeanor. Why? Sure, Chris, there are a couple of reasons for that. We're talking about the top people in the company. It's not enough to say there are lies and there's deceit and this and that. You have to prove your case. Obviously you have to, but if you've already proven your case, well, you've, you've gotten the corporation to settle. Then with it, no admission of liability. With no, well, that's, isn't, that, isn't that the get out of jail free card? Because when you're admitting to $2.2 billion worth of wrong and saying, but I don't know how it happened. Joe Troutwine, let me throw this one to you because this intrigues me. Take a look at what we've got up on the screen here. This is a picture of Montgomery Ward Chairman Sewell Avery back in the 1940s. My employer did state under oath in, in the trial that he fired me because I'm gay and solely right. because I'm gay and, and, often said, and also said I was the best employee he had at that time. I think he also said at the time, they, I think in a deposition, they asked him, was he a good employee? And he said, not if he was homosexual. Yeah, I think he made that comment, yes. All right, so what happened? Did, did, you, did you prevail at the trial level and then you lost on appeal? What happened there? Because I think it did go up to the appeals court and you lost two to one. We, it, we did, but we also lost at the trial level. The first thing that I have to ask or my assistant has to ask is, which county do you live in, right? It's this patchwork of laws around the county and, and how Bucks defines LGBT discrimination may be different than how Montgomery defines it. Let's make this very it. clear for the viewer tonight, because they right. may not understand that even right. though Pennsylvania has not adopted any law dealing with sexual orientation discrimination or gender identity, a lot of cities have done that. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of municipalities yeah, have done that. There are actually 33 municipalities in yeah. the state of Pennsylvania 33 that have adopted, across, right. including Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia. Well, you, you certainly threw in the kitchen sink there, Anthony. <laughs> Anything that could go wrong did go wrong, although I especially enjoyed the part of uh, the gal dancing to aerobics with a half gallon of ice cream. That was a nice, that was a nice touch. That was really, you like that, Robin, huh? <laughs> I did. I, I have three words for that company, keystroke monitoring technology. Okay? I mean, if you're going to have people working at home, first of all, you ought to take precautions. For all of us here at the American Law Journal, thanks for joining us this week. Till next Monday night. Case closed.